This episode of the Virginia History Podcast is brought to you in part by Gary Sullivan, our newest Patreon subscriber. For more information about how to support the podcast, stay tuned until the end of the episode. Carry me back to old Virginia. <laughs> The war unfolded across the British Isles in the 1640s. Sir William Berkeley continued to rule Virginia in the name of King Charles. Berkeley stood firmly behind King Charles' government. He had also stood firm in his support of the Anglican Church. Though he made these stances, Berkeley allowed and further encouraged Virginia's transformation into a new, different colony a colony that offered opportunity apart from the monarchy. The greatest of all Virginia's opportunities lay in the land. But who owned the land? Charles? Parliament? The Powhatan Confederacy? This is one of the most difficult questions still debated today. Berkeley's government won the argument by force. Megaphone marauders beating down my battered door Master of the soapbox gonna shout a little more Tin Pan Alley Tomcat said I'd be a millionaire I lost my sense of time, I didn't even care I try believing, believing in the goodness of man I learned my lesson He took all I had Turned around and ran Yeah, man, it's still a crazy world I guess some things I never An influx of new settlers started arriving just after Berkeley's installation as Virginia's governor. Lands which had been previously gobbled up were unavailable to these new settlers. So they were forced to migrate into new regions. Doing so meant that fresh issues arose in the assembly as well as between the English and Powhatan Confederation. For years, the Powhatans had been retreating further northward and westward away from the main English power centers. Thus, the pre-Berkeley assembly had no issues expanding their territorial claims. In fact, part of one of their meetings summarily stated that if enough settlers claimed land along both the York's north side as well as the south side of the Rappahannock rivers, then they'd begin colonizing what is today known as the Middle Peninsula. The issue was that this area was the traditional homeland of the Powhatan Confederation, where Wacomico, Powhatan's capital, for instance, was located within these new boundaries. The Pamunkey and Mattaponi, two of the leading Powhatan tribes, could also be found further up the York River tributaries named for them. There would be outrage, though not immediate. The pre-Berkeley Assembly seemingly assuaged their consciences by offering Opecancano a yearly payment of 50 barrels of corn in exchange for the lands now being settled. They would have colonized, corn or not. Once Berkeley arrived on the scene, many settlements had already been undertaken in the Middle Peninsula that would eventually be dominated by some of the most prominent names in Virginia's history, such as Wormley, Chichley, Tolliver, and Burwell. One such Middle Peninsula settler wasn't content with his land on the Wicomico River. He moved further northward across the Rappahannock River and established a plantation at Cone Hall. This 1640 undertaking made John Mottram the first English settler in what is now known as the Northern Neck. Mottram, as we'll see, went on to become a key player over the next decade, mostly due to his ardent Protestant stance. Though the English continued moving northward, the native tribes wouldn't go lightly. They often caused trouble amongst the earliest settlers, which forced many of the English back southward. Others, however, were not dissuaded by the Powhatans and continued to look for newer, larger land opportunities. Once Berkeley arrived on the scene, he realized that there was indeed a settlement concern demanding his attention. On the one hand, Berkeley sought to maintain peace, even if it were tenuous. On the other hand, Berkeley's arrival accompanied with the ensuing political tensions back in England signaled the arrival of a new type of wealthier settler. These settlers were very well connected, and they saw new possibilities especially in tobacco. Tobacco ate up land at a voracious rate, because after a few years the weeds sapped all nutrients from the native soil. Thus, every few years, new farmland was required in order to keep wealth-making possibilities going. 
Virginia's earliest settlers had not yet understood the wisdom of crop rotation, so they attempted to claim as much land as possible as quickly as possible. The Middle Peninsula afforded such new land potential. What was Berkeley to do, especially in opposition to men associated with the powerful Matthews Claiborne faction? He attempted to contain the settlement craze by working with the Assembly to pass laws forbidding settlement on the Rappahannock River. The law wasn't a total ban on settlement, but it did want the region to remain unseated until all governing bodies agreed that settling the north side of the Middle Peninsula was safe. The laws were passed, but governing Virginia wasn't as easy as it may have once been. Colonials settling on the Middle Peninsula and Northern Neck were further away from Jamestown and had one or two rivers between them and the capital. Therefore, men like Mottram could do whatever they pleased with relative ease. Opikankano, on the other hand, had his own idea about how to stop the encroaching English. Man, man, what you gonna do? It's harder every day Just trying to make it through It's true Maybe judgment day is overdue Walking home alone, I took a trail down through the pines, serenaded by the song of a world I left behind. Berkeley and his government had no reason to think that the Powhatans were a serious threat. That being the case, they continued business as normal throughout 1643. That's the year that Berkeley established the Anglican Church's authority, while also empowering local Virginians to patronize their own Anglican establishments. This act had longer-lasting repercussions that men like Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson championed generations later. But 1643 governmental innovations didn't stop with the early religious acts. The Assembly passed a law essentially stating that the governor and his council couldn't lay any taxes or impositions upon this colony, their lands, or commodities otherwise, then by the authority of the Grand Assembly to be levied and employed as by the Assembly shall be appointed. There were older versions of this statement from 1624 and 1632, but the 1643 statement had more weight to it and might have caught King Charles' gaze had the English Civil War not occupied his attention. Berkeley, though Charles Mann, couldn't withstand his assembly, but it doesn't seem likely that he tried to anyway. Regardless of Berkeley's stance, this act and the previous smaller precedents foreshadowed the much better known no taxation without representation cries that came generations later. Another 1643 act opened trade with the Dutch by lessening customs payments. The assembly saw wisdom in trading with the Dutch who brought needed wares, and sadly sometimes Africans, into Virginia. In exchange, the Dutch could load their ships with tobacco to be sold on the European market. This benefited both sides as the Dutch were by far the 17th century's greatest merchants. That being the case, Dutchmen such as Simon Overzee also started settling in the Chesapeake Bay region. Overzee, the most infamous of these Dutch planters, was known as a notoriously disagreeable man. Yet somehow, he managed to marry into two of 17th century Virginia's most prominent families when he first married Sarah Thorogood sometime in 1647. Then after Sarah died, Overzee next married Elizabeth Willoughby sometime in 1659 before he died the next year. Overzay's land holdings in Virginia and Maryland reveal that he had made quite a name for himself in the short period he lived in both colonies. He had considerable holdings in Charles County, Maryland, but he too can be counted along with John Mottram as being an early northern neck settler. We can deduce this in that after Overzay died, his widow Elizabeth is known to have taken control of his estates, valued at over 100,000 pounds of tobacco, according to a Northumberland County inventory completed in the early 1660s. We also know that Overzay wasn't involved in Virginia only. He is in Maryland court records as having beaten one Tony a slave to death, thus illustrating some of the earliest known conflict between incoming Africans and Europeans. But we'll talk more about that in another episode. Finally, and arguably the most notable 1643 governmental action, however, was the first act encouraged by Governor Berkeley. He chose to separate the Burgesses into their own house, thus formally creating the House of Burgesses. The remaining governmental members, including Governor Berkeley and his Council of State, would remain together apart from the House of Burgesses, creating an upper house of sorts. Thus, Virginia's government became bicameral. The Burgesses enthusiastically accepted this setup, 
because they rightly saw it as increasing and validating the burgesses and their constituents' authority. This action paved the way for much more specific governance in that it was the burgesses who generally deemed what was necessary business, not a monarchy across the Atlantic. Otherwise, the government had to wait intolerably long periods of time in order to receive word from the crown, if they received word at all. Taken together, Berkeley's 1643 work made him famously popular among English Virginians. Trade boomed, tobacco prices were quite high, and immigrants found land aplenty. Tensions with the Powhatan Confederacy seemed to be a thing of the past. But as in 1622, Opie Cancano bided his time well, lulled the English into a false sense of security, and struck a devastating blow against many English settlements on Maundy Thursday, April 18, 1644. It's I worry that I never had a choice Have we all been misguided? Just another voice Adding to the noise Yeah, man Opie Cancano had a finger on the contemporary Virginia Pulse and realized that some type of change was taking place because of Berkeley's plans. Berkeley and a few of his closest advisors seemed to understand that tensions were dangerously high between the Middle Peninsula settlers and the Powhatan Confederacy, but no one took the time to build any defenses or train and outfit militias against potential threats, because no one in higher office thought a fight was imminent. They didn't even notice growing warrior numbers along the frontier. Opie Cancano further seems to have chosen to attack on Maundy Thursday, because he knew the English would further have dropped their guard in preparation for Easter Sunday. Governor Berkeley even commanded prayer and fasting to be done for the embattled King Charles on that day. So the Powhatan leader guessed correctly. The lack of defenses, focus on other issues, English Civil War concerns, and religious devotion combined to allow a devastating Powhatan blindside attack. Opie Cancano's warriors crossed mostly unopposed into English settlements, alongside the south side of the James River, as well as the heads of the York, Rappahannock, and various smaller inland rivers. Most of the more than 500 that died over the next few days fell along the York River and further inland as those locations were further away from more fortified English holdings. In contrast to the 1622 massacre, more died in 1644, but the colony by that time held more than 8,000 people, as opposed to the approximately 1,200 in 1622. So the attack though it had higher casualties, affected the colony proportionately less than it did in 1622. The issue was still something that had to be handled, but the English weren't prepared for a battle. Berkeley and the Assembly set about seeking for aid and supplies elsewhere, such as when the Assembly authorized Cornelius Lloyd to go to New Netherland to ask for supplies. The Assembly also pressured Berkeley to return to England in order to obtain better weapons from the Crown. But both missions were doomed to fail, because of the English Civil War, and the Dutch didn't respond to Lloyd's petitions. In fact, what was supposed to be a quick trip for Berkeley turned into his aiding King Charles against the Roundheads before Berkeley finally returned to Virginia in 1645. Another area from which the Virginians attempted to collect resources used recent history as their cause to say no. Massachusetts Bay Governor John Winthrop told Virginia that the 1644 attack was God's judgment for how Berkeley and his assembly expelled Puritan ministers from Virginia. That being the case, Winthrop said he wouldn't supply the requested power needed to fight Opie Cancano. Interestingly enough, a powder magazine exploded in Massachusetts Bay soon thereafter, and Winthrop thought it was God's judgment for saying no to his fellow Englishmen in Virginia. Thomas Steggs having obtained letters of mark from the Earl of Warwick didn't help matters either. Stegg used that commission to attack a Bristol vessel loaded with fish that was at anchor in Boston Harbor. Because of that action, anti-Virginian opinion bubbled over within the week as Boston ministers very publicly denounced Stegg's action. I guess some things are never gonna change Yeah, man, what you gonna do? It's harder every day Just trying to make it through It's true Maybe Judgment Day is overdue. 
On the battlefront, the early fight didn't go too well during Berkeley's absence. A huge reason for this was William Claiborne, who began coordinating attacks against Maryland instead. The Assembly attempted to spread the cost of fighting Opecancano across all settlements, including John Mottram's establishment Chickacone on the Potomac River, just across from Catholic Maryland. Chickacone had become a Protestant safe haven, which made Mottram's location a prime launching point in Maryland for men like Claiborne and his allies. What resources the Virginians did collect were soon diverted through Mottram's Protestant hideaway and into Claiborne's personal vendetta with the Calverts. With Berkeley across the Atlantic, Claiborne saw an opportunity to attack the Calverts, with powerful backing too, I might add. That backing included men like John Carter, William Durand, Daniel Gookin Jr., who soon fled to Boston in support of the Puritan cause, and Richard Bennett, who saw wisdom in supporting Claiborne's jaunt. Samuel Matthews also had interest in lands north of the York, as he patented 4,000 acres on the Rappahannock. The Matthews Claiborne faction was added again. This time, they added the Protestant cause against the Catholics to their battle flag. Governor Berkeley found a mess upon his return. The Matthews Claiborne faction used their land grab to aid Richard Engel in a rebellion against the Calvert led Maryland government. Virginia forces, therefore, had done little to destroy Opecancano's power. So now Berkeley would have to concern himself with two conflicts. First, Berkeley decided to take the fight to the Powhatans himself. He led many successful campaigns but couldn't pin Opecancano down. Berkeley then called his assembly together in order to figure out how to catch the wily old chief. A letter from former captive Margaret Worley was read to the assembly, which pinpointed Opecancano's whereabouts. According to the letter, the Powhatan leader wanted peace. He wanted to redeem his captives and end the fight. To do so, he proposed a meeting at the newly established Fort Royal on the Pamunkey River. Captain Henry Fleet was then commissioned to meet with Opecancano at his middle plantation home, but the meeting never took place. Instead, it was at this time that the assembly authorized Fort Henry's construction on the Appomattox River. Sixty men who were to be stationed at the new fort were put under Francis Poyther's control. Poyther's was then directed by Henry Fleet to capture Opecancano. But the cost to undertake the offensive was too high. The ensuing taxes to support the mission soon threatened English stability so too did pressure from the increasingly victorious English parliamentarians. But before all fell into confusion, Berkeley stepped in to lead the charge. He personally organized an army and took the fight into the interior. Opecancano was then taken prisoner between the York and James Rivers, somewhere near modern-day Petersburg, and brought back to Jamestown. Remaining Indian warriors were then rounded up and sent to Tangier Island in the Chesapeake Bay, far enough away from posing any potential danger. According to 17th century Virginia historian Robert Beverly, Opecancano was treated with utmost respect by Berkeley, who had hoped to send his captive to face the English in London. Before the prisoner was loaded onto a ship, however, a disgruntled guard shot Opecancano in the back, just two weeks after being captured. Come October 1646, Nakotowance, Opecancano's successor, signed a treaty ending what is now called the Third Anglo-Palatan War. Berkeley claimed a resounding victory that brought peace for the next three decades. The Powhatan Confederation, however, was shattered. They were to surrender all lands between the falls of the James and York Rivers to the Chesapeake Bay. They were permitted to hunt on the north side of the York River, but were not allowed to cross southward unless they wore a special badge and were given permission to pass. For the time being, any Englishman who dared cross northward beyond the falls would also be punished with a felony. The potential bright side to all of this, as Wilkham Washburn notes, is that the Indians were for the first time treated as equals, with equal rights to live on the land with the English and enjoy the rights of human beings. They were no longer considered vermin to be exterminated whenever the opportunity presented itself. The setting aside of land for the Indians was a first in Virginia's English history that foreshadows today's reservation system, sort of. Berkeley fought hard to keep this system intact and it would later affect his popularity. But at this time in Virginia, Berkeley was a hero. He was a hero not just on the battlefield, however. Berkeley also helped establish laws against taverns who were cheating customers out of the price of liquor, formed laws against millers who were overcharging for their wares, as well as expelling lawyers who charged for their services. 
The common citizens further rejoiced at Berkeley's allowing general court cases to be tried at the county level, thus alleviating often impossible trips to Jamestown from the colony's far-off reaches. Another action that brought Berkeley much praise was his abolishing the poll tax, a tax too burdensome for the poorer settler to pay. Instead, Berkeley wanted colonial funds to be raised across the Virginia landscape more equally, which included suspending exemptions that those on the council enjoyed. Part of this burden-sharing scheme involved Northumberland County, who the assembly tried to tax in 1645, but the new county refused to pay during the Anglo-Palatine War because they had other interests. Berkeley sought to curtail the renegades, but his attempt to enforce the tax was part of a greater issue that reached back into contemporary England and affected all of the colonies, none more than Virginia and Maryland. The Cavalier Roundhead fight reached deep into the colonial heart and by 1646 threatened stability along the Chesapeake Bay. It directly threatened Governor Berkeley, who ardently supported the crown. Thank you again for supporting the podcast. It's greatly appreciated. Please continue to spread the word and help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and visit the website. Sharing episodes and other work is the best way to expand the community. Another way to greatly aid the podcast is by providing feedback on iTunes. If you have yet to do so, please take a few minutes and leave us a comment. Doing so helps bring exposure in the iTunes network. It also helps me to know what I need to improve on in future episodes. If you would like to support the work financially, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. Links can be found on the website, or one can visit the campaign at patreon.com forward slash VAHISPOD to see the choices and rewards being offered for your generosity. And please, join me next time as we continue walking through Virginia's history. Do do bad, do 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 do